So we wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you guys for coming. We're super excited to have everybody here and to see the interest that everyone has in PTAP. We have a variety of people here from different organizations. We have municipalities, consultants, we have UNH, EPA, and DES, and maybe some other organizations that I, I missed, but welcome. We're excited to have you here. So our goal yeah. is to make this uh, workshop very interactive. So we ask that if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. We have a certain times that we have set aside for questions. And you can also use the raise hand function and I'll keep track of whose hand was up first. So we make sure everybody gets their questions answered. Um, the recording of this workshop is going to go up on the new PTAP website, which is on the New Hampshire MS4 webpage. This will also have that recording there and all other PTAP related resources. And I'll show everybody where that is at the end of the meeting, but just know that if you have to leave early or if you want to rewatch this, the recording will be up online. And I'm going to pass it over to Ted Deers to give us a nice opening and some background information on PTAP. Hey, well, thank you very much, Tom. And it is, uh, it is really great to be here. This is sort of uh, PTAP uh, comes of age. Uh, kind of uh, approach here that we've been working on this for a very long time, many years. Uh, this is uh, a lot of meetings in, but um, it's been absolutely worth it to create a system that's going to, I think, really serve the communities uh, to do what they need to do. So let's just talk a little about how we got here. First of all, my name is Ted Deers. I'm the Assistant Director for the Water Division at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. I've previously worked as the Watershed Bureau Administrator as we were developing this project. And um, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right. Tom, we're looking good? Perfect. Great, excellent. Again, welcome everybody. So um, as we started to develop this program almost 10 years ago, we uh, really wanted to make it as fun as possible. Uh, I wanted to make it as fun as possible because learning about this and tracking pollution isn't exactly, you know, the glitzy of, of, of activities, um, but don't, uh, don't try to say that to Jamie. Hull. But it, is, um, it has been an interesting development process, and I'm going to talk a little about how we got here. So the, the, let's just hit break down the four words, pollution, tracking, counting, program. This really is about how do we track pollutants, that is contaminants in the water. Um, we need to understand where they're going, uh, account for them, and then have a long-term sustainable program to do so. So this idea of, of, of where this kind of came out of is really about it's kind of like the it's kind of like developing your turbo tax for pollution. So it was we need to understand we a lot of us have receipts that are sitting in boxes. You know, you know where things got built, you know things happened on on the landscape. People put in best management practices, your community has been doing things. It's not like people have been sitting on their hands. So you have this box full of receipts. What you didn't what we don't really have until now is a way of taking those receipts, putting them into the system and understanding our credits and debits. And that's really what this system is all about. DES invested through a number of different sources, primarily the uh, state revolving fund program, over $300,000 in the development of this, of this of PTAP. And the reason we did that is because this is so important. This was a high level investment because it's really critical to us. We, and I'll talk a little about why. And you'll see some themes through here. Um, again, trying to make this a little bit more fun, uh, uh, this sort of P-tap dance, P-tap dancing. You'll see as we go along here, there's a few, uh, a few tidbits on that. From DS's perspective, we have a really, we, we really wanna make sure that you all have tools to be able to do the kinds of things that you wanna do. Uh, MS4 communities have requirements to do certain things, have requirements to install certain things or track certain things. The science of nitrogen, where is nitrogen? And that drove this whole thing relative to Great Bay. Great Bay, we know has some nitrogen challenges. Uh, it was about, when we started this, it was about 30% wastewater, 70% non-point source. That means that 
you know, a lot of a lot of investment was made by the communities in the in in the point source in their wastewater treatment plants. Mil hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested. But the big portion of this is the non-point source. So how do we track that? How do we understand what that means? Money, making sure you're getting your value. What's the trade-off between a pound of nitrogen from a wastewater treatment plant versus a pound of nitrogen from a, 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 a structural method, structural control method? And then the politics of all of this, showing accountability to the public that we are doing things. We know we're doing things. Communities are doing great things. But how do you show it? How do you prove it? And that has a political aspect about it, which is again, why we invested so much in this. So then that would come down to the point of why you should think about PTAP and why you're here today. Many of you are here because you need to comply with permits. That is either NIFTES permits, MS4 permits, other kinds of things. Many of you probably wanna show progress. You're, there's pressure from the community to show we are doing things and we are tracking those things and communicating that activity either to the regulators or to your, your constituents. This is an opportunity to engage across departments. This is an interesting animal in that you have this, this sort of permits that go to primarily your DPW, but land use is tracked through your planning department or some other part of, of the town. How do you engage across those departments? That's not always a natural activity in communities. And then obviously quantifying, quantifying in a, in a solid, you know, quantifiable way, those, those numeric way, the kinds of progress you're making towards cleaning non-point source pollution. And of course, fun and excitement. You're not alone in this. There are DES, we're fully engaged. We have made a huge, a huge investment in both staff. I wanna point out Tom Swenson, we have Andrea uh, Vetlick in here. We have Deb Loizel, who you know. Um, and these folks are really dedicated to providing you extraordinary customer service and technical assistance to help you through these processes. We have the UNH Stormwater Center, worldwide leaders in understanding stormwater, non-point source pollution, tracking, accounting, um, the curves that have been developed, the, redu the you know, reduction curve. All of these kinds of things that the, the Stormwater Center, as well as being a wealth of information and a repository for information. We have the original four communities who are involved in this. Exeter, Newmarket, Dover, and I'll forget one, I'm sorry. Uh, we had four communities who've been involved very much in this from right from the outset. And those four communities have experts who've been doing this for a while. Lean on each other. And finally, there's, I know that there's some consultants in the audience here, and I'm, that's great. That's great to see because you're going to be able to help your clients to get through this process, and that's good for everybody to expand that. So what are you going to be doing over the next few, uh, few workshops here? Today, and, and I just point out the folks who are going to help you through this, Sally Soul is our leader. Uh, she has been working on this from day one, she and Jamie Hool. Uh, are the, 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 the parents, they birthed this thing um, and it was painful to do so, but uh, totally worth it now that we have our, our now mature uh, PTAP baby. Um, and Dan McAdam, uh, an engineer with the, the Stormwater Center also joining in to help to, uh, to give this training uh, and to be a resource for you all. Today, you're gonna learn how to sign up for a PTAP account and how to enter in structural controls. Next sessions coming up, you'll learn about how to deal with non-structural best management practices, and then the special exception stuff that always happens because almost everything always feels like an exception. So there'll be opportunities to learn about that as well. I just wanna point out that you get out of this training what you put into it. So ask lots of questions. As, as Tom mentioned right at the outset, this is meant to be interactive. You have experts here in front of you. Please, please ask questions. And when you go away, practice. You can't do this if you don't practice and then teach and then ask questions and then teach your colleagues how to do it. Teaching is the best, teaching is the best teacher. And that's, I think one of the things that's really important about this is to take the knowledge that you gain here today and show other people how to use it. And just keep doing that and, and you will become you know, proficient at, at P-tapping. 
I pro many of you probably feel that this is onerous, that doing this feels like the end of the world. And I assure you, it's not. Other communities have made this work. Other communities have benefited from it. And you certainly uh, can too. It's much more, um, it's much more just a very mild sense of threat uh, as opposed to the end of the world uh, when you're dealing with PTAP and lots of help for you. So I hope you have a great session today and I hope that this kicks off this great workshop series for you all to learn and become proficient in PTAP. And as always, please, please, if you don't like something, if you do like something, if you think something should change or be added, please contact one of us. This is my contact information and I'm gonna turn it over to, um, over to Jamie uh, to now start to kick us off into uh, the training. So um, thank you all everyone for being here and please uh, reach out to me if you have any comments. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Uh, before we go into PTAP, I am going to take a second and I'm just going to go through some of the MS4 requirements. I know we have a lot of people here that are very familiar and attend our coalition meetings regularly, but for those that are new or kind of on the outskirts and only dabble in MS4, we're just going to give you guys a quick overview. Ted, can you nod if you can see my screen? Oh, or Daniel, I see your face. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I'm just going to look to the other screen. I'm not being rude, but I'm just trying to keep an eye on the, the waiting room as well. So first off, we want to state that all MS4 permittees can use PTAP. PTAP. It doesn't matter what kind of impairment you have. We are encouraging everyone to use it. Obviously, it's voluntary. You are not required to use it. But tracking your structural and non-structural BMPs and kind of getting ahead of the curve if this was ever required later on. We never know. We don't we can't say that it will be, but if it is, you could get ahead of the curve and get all this information in right away. But there are certain permittees that do have to track their nutrient reductions. And those permittees are those with phosphorus. You can see this right on the screen, phosphorus TMDLs, um, nitrogen impairments, and phosphorus impairments. So those are the communities that have to track their nutrient reductions in some way. And PTAP's a way that you can do that. So we're just going to take a really quick breakdown of some of the requirements. I've paraphrased them since, as we all know, if you've ever opened the MS4 permit, there's a lot of words there and we don't have time to go through all that. So I'm just going to go through some, some quick highlights. So first off, we're going to start in Appendix F. That's the section that deals with TMDLs and this specifically deals with phosphorus TMDLs. So if you're a permittee that has this, this applies to you. Um, in section III.1.B, it talks about performance evaluations of your LPCP or Lake Phosphorus Control Plan. And the requirements ask that you track the amount of phosphorus reductions achieved through implemented structural and non-structural BNPs. So whatever you have implemented, they're asking that you track those to see the amount of phosphorus that, phosphorus that has been reduced. They also ask that you track the amount of phosphorus increases resulting from new development in the LPCP area. So if someone were to build a new house around a water body in that watershed, they're asking you to take that into account because that's addi additional phosphorus loading that would be going into that water body. There we go. Um, along the same lines, this still is under um, Appendix F for those with phosphorus TMDLs. Section III.1.C talks about annual calculation reporting. So this is something that will have to be done annually for all those with phosphorus TMDLs. They ask that you calculate the amount of non-structural BMP nutrient reduction that you've achieved along with the structural BMP nutrient reduction that you achieved. And then again, if they're asking you to do that calculation for that new development increases in phosphorus loading. And then they're going to ask you to take all that information, so basically the phosphorus that you're removing and then the phosphorus that's being added with new development to calculate your yearly phosphorus export rate to see if you are meeting the goals set forth in your LPCP to reduce phosphorus. Lastly, and this is a little more straightforward, those communities with a nitrogen or phosphorus impairment that fall under Appendix H, this is for you guys. We have a lot more of those people than we do 
with people for phosphorus TMDLs. So this is in section um, I.1.C.III of Appendix H. And basically, this is a little shorter, so I'm going to read it. Any structural BMPs listed in Attachment 3 to Appendix F installed in the regulated area by the permittee or its agent shall be tracked, and the permittee shall estimate the nitrogen slash phosphorus removal by the BMP consistent with Attachment 3 to Appendix F. You're going to hear a lot of talk about Attachment 3 today. Um, attachment 3 of Appendix F just basically lays out how your nutrient reductions will be calculated. So PTAP uses those nutrient reductions. That's why it works well with the MS4 permit. And so this requirement here is just asking that any BMPs that you install um, due to the MS4 permit, that you're tracking them to know how much nutrient reduction you're getting. It also asks that the permittee shall document the BMP type, the total area treated by the BMP, the design storage volume of the BMP, and the estimated nitrogen slash phosphorus removed in mass per year by the BNP in each annual report. PTAP can do all those things for you. Jamie will talk, Jamie and Daniel will talk about this more, but there's a report that they'll give you of all your PTAP information that you can use in your annual report. So all you have to do is get this information into PTAP, and then you can gather this information, and Jamie will send it to you, and you can put it in your annual report. That's it on the MS4 side. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay, I didn't think so because I recognize a lot of your faces. So now I'm going to show, send it over to Jamie to actually get into the PTAP side of things. All right. Thanks, Tom. And can you nod if you can see my screen? All right. So we thought we needed TED, but all we needed to do is read some permit language to make the math actually kind of seem fun. All right, I'm Jamie Hull. I'm the um, director of the University of New Hampshire Stormwater Center and also one of the co-developers of PTAP along with uh, Ted and, and Sally and the DES team. And as Ted said, we've been doing this for, for quite a while. You're seeing a picture of uh, a ship sailing in fog. That was kind of our logo for at least uh, the first five or six years of the development of this, largely because I think the math is, is relatively easy and straightforward. It's all pretty much outlined for you. We're not inventing anything, but it's developing of the process. And it's the, I think the human dimensions of this activity, uh, getting everybody on board, getting everybody to be consistent and speak in the same way about these terms is was one of the, the um, hassles. And then as you'll see moving forward, I think the major benefit of all these years of experience is we've taken what can be a really, really complicated subject. I mean, you can track hundreds of hundreds of details and, and quantities and, and qualities associated with these controls. And we've really tried to distill them down to the important ones. So I hope by the end of this, you realize that the significant amount of work that's been invested in this and the money, as Ted said, that's been invested from DES has yielded a, a functional product that makes it as simple as possible. Okay, so with that, the, this is the basic workshop. We're not gonna go into uh, a tremendous amount of detail. We're really gonna give you an introduction into the uh, user levels, uh, some basic data entry, and we're gonna focus on uh, municipal retrofit. So as Tom was outlining the permit, uh, if you have a water quality limited um, water body for nitrogen or impaired water body for nitrogen and phosphorus, you're installing at least one structural control this year and that can go into PTAP and we can use that to account uh, in addition to anything else you might be doing. So we're going to focus on uh, municipal retrofits and that's uh, probably one of the easiest ways to enter things into PDAP because there's no associated land use change. So we're just, you know, this is uh, installing something in the built environment and this is all credit, right? There's no really associated land use change. So you don't have to deal with that land use change table, You're just dealing with the uh, structural BMP table. Um, so we like to continually have these workshops because PTAP is a adaptive tool. We are constantly working with the end users. They're constantly giving us feedback. Uh, and 
we we have a great team here at UNH. It's the um, UNH Research Computing Center has been with us the whole way, and they are really really good about responding to uh, end user needs. Um, you know, simple things like can you add a link to an email for the person that's entering something into PTAP? So if uh, I have to review it, I have someone to respond to. Very easy. We get that done within a day. So um, you know, this this product is constantly changing, constantly improving. The other thing is, although we started about 10 years ago, the relevance of PTAP is really coming into focus now. Certainly in the Great Bay, with the Great Bay total nitrogen general permit, it's, you know, it's it's become the, the, the fog has certainly lifted, I think, with the communities involved in the Great Bay total nitrogen general permit. And this is the first year that we're actually going to be able to report a trend line. So we're going to be able to compare last year's load reductions to this year's. And hopefully this will really demonstrate that interim accountability um, that Ted was talking about as we wait for the environmental data, the data that's being collected by PrEP and other entities in the Great Bay, as we wait for that to really take shape. And we know that that's going to take a while because it didn't happen overnight. Uh, and environmental data doesn't really quickly show responses to all the great work that's happening. It takes time. It takes years. All right. So at its basic level, the PTAP database is a user authenticated database. And, and the benefit of this is uh, there's other databases that are out there. Some of you might have been, be involved with the EPA tool, the BMP tracking and accounting tool, otherwise known as the BAT. Um, and uh, that, that's a very useful tool. However, anybody can enter anything into it. Uh, so the real benefit of the PTAP tracking database is there's a systematic way um, that we organize the, the structure and the hierarchy of users so that only, only projects that are active and built get put into the um, database. There's other means to track a project through something like permitting, but only built and constructed uh, structural controls actually get added to the database. So that it, in, in my mind, it's really useful because it allows a, a, town, um, a town user to track developments and authorize their entry into the database when they're constructed. So, at the very top here, we have the super administrator. That's the research computing center, UNH Research Computing Center. Um, they have full control uh, and, and can have built and can manipulate the database as, as needed. Then we have the site administrators. And I think we wanted to point out that these are human beings. So this is like Daniel, myself, and Sally. So um, I don't know that being human these days is, a, is an attribute, but um, we like it because it, it, like Sally will tell you as well, we get hundreds of emails uh, on a monthly basis of uh, Russian hackers trying to get into the database. I don't know why, I don't know what the benefits could be of uh, entering our database, but you know we oversee uh, the admission of all authenticated users. And that's really the, the, um, the last, um, that last hierarchy, which I'll go over at the end, every, everybody else is an authenticated user. So people that come in, apply for an account, and we authorize their account, become authenticated users. And, and I'll, I'll kind of go over that last. Uh, the town administrator might not be an app name because most towns have an administrator, but this is the PTAP administrator. This would be someone that has the responsibility and authority in the town to review and accept permits. So this could be the DPW um, director or the engineer or um, the planning uh, the planning board administrator. Um, it, it's someone identified at the town level that can say, yes, this entry from an authenticated user is happening in our town and everything looks real and legit. And I'm gonna um, classify this development uh, in a number of different ways. So they are really the gatekeepers for what goes into um, a town's ledger. Um, you can have multiple, towns can have multiple administrators 
I think we originally uh, thought of this as one person, just because it could get difficult if um, you know one person is admitting some projects and and another person is not communicating. But if you have great communication, you can have as many administrators as you want. We also created a uh, this town employee um, a classification such that maybe you have people that. Uh, you want to review the whole submission, and the submission really contains all the functional elements of the structural control or the non-structural control, and you want people to be able to look at it and review it, but you want to maintain um, the authority over the classification of those projects, you can also nominate town employees. Um, everybody else is an authenticated user. Authenticated users would be developers, consultants, uh, other people that are entering things in the database, authenticated users can look at everything that they've entered. They can enter into any municipality that has a um, that has a uh, spot in the database, and they can, but they can only look at things and edit things that they've input. Whereas a town administrator can can review, classify, and edit any entry that comes in to the database under that town. So hopefully that makes sense. And we'll we'll pause for questions uh, a little later. I don't know why that's not hidden, but um, I, we want to go into the, the elements, particularly around structural controls. And this is where we take hundreds and hundreds of potential metrics and really reduce them down to basically four. So there's four fundamental things that you need to track, and I'll briefly review them all to get things and to get credit into the database. The first is the uh, drainage area. And we're not taking shortcuts here, but we're trying to simplify things. If you've done the calculations of a watershed area and you've done impervious and pervious and you've modeled everything, you know that at this level of control, we're talking about the performance curves go from a, a zero to two inch physical storage capacity. At that level, it's really only impervious cover that's contributing excess precipitation or runoff to your control. So that's what we focus on. So you need to know the drainage area and more, more specifically, the impervious cover associated with the drainage area going to your structural control. That's number one. Number two, is you need to know the BMP type. So you're going to classify it right now one of 10 different ways. There's 10 uh, performance curves that are being utilized, and those are all outlined in Appendix F. Again, we're not inventing this. This is not our crediting scheme. We're accessing the, um, the power of the performance curves that EPA Region 1 have developed and put into the permit. Next, you need to know the design storage volume, and I'll go over that very briefly. Um, but this is just the physical capacity of the system to store, instantaneously store water. Uh, and finally, you need to know, have some estimate either measured or from something like a web soil survey of the hydrologic soil group. So I'm going to go into these uh, a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, the BMP type. I said it's one of 10 structural controls that have performance curve developed for them. And we know that in the, in, the, in the universe of structural controls, there are infinite names for these things. Um, we took a look at just the, Mass the old Massachusetts manual and the old New Hampshire stormwater manual. I say old because these two manuals are currently in redevelopment. Um, but we took a look at the nomenclature and we provided this crosswalk of ways to um, cl class of common ways to classify your structural control. One of the hardest things to get around is say a bioretention system. A bioretention system that you anticipate uh, excess infiltration or excess losses through infiltration um, you would actually model as a infiltration basin. I know sometimes it doesn't make sense, but just suffice it to say the biofiltration curve in the permit only looks at the filtration component. 
So it would be for bioretention, let's say, that's in a poor soil that, or that has underdrains at the very bottom of the system, and you're not anticipating many losses to infiltration. So there's a few of these nuances that um, we're not going to get into the detail, but uh, a convention crosswalk like this would help you classify how to um, how to categorize your BMP. If you're not on the map and you have no idea, I would say pick the most appropriate system. We recently had a, a conversation about a, a, a wet pond. Um, you know, how would we model a wet pond? And there actually is a curve for a wet basin. So, you know, that would that's that's pretty clear and straightforward. All right. Design storage volume might be the most difficult new acronym that is being introduced here. And I realize we are swimming in a sea of acronyms. And here is yet another one. This is very much like a water quality volume. What I like about design storage volume over water quality volume is every system has this. So you don't need to do tremendous amounts of math. Any design system has a design storage volume. And really, Functionally, what it is, is the storage capacity, instantaneous storage capacity for water in the system. And so what you do is you take the dimensions of your system and you have some assessment of the porosity and you calculate this design storage volume, which will yield the number in cubic feet. So for example, if you had a simple detention pond, you would calculate the length, width, and depth of the storage area in your detention pond. That storage area is, is has a porosity of one because it's a ponding area, right? All that space is available for water. And that would be it. That So it would be length times width times depth times one. And that would be in cubic feet, your design storage volume for a simple uh, structure like a detention pond. For a, like a bio retention area, it might be a little bit more complicated because you'll likely have a ponding area, a filter area, and a stone area. The only difference is there's a reduction in porosity in these in these levels. So, and we we add in the um, directions that are linked on that PTAB website that Tom showed uh, two directions on how to calculate this. These definitions are also in Appendix F of the MS4 permit. It will explain how to calculate specifically the design storage volume uh, for each system that has a performance curve. So there's lots of resources. The fundamental thing is the porosity. Typically we use estimates. So for any type of soil media, we typically use a porosity of 0 0.2. And that just means that 20% of that area is available for water storage. Uh, for stone, and whether it's three quarter inch stone or really there's not that much difference between three quarter inch, uh, three eighths inch, or even like a two inch minus a uh, larger diameter stone, we typically use 0.4. You can get more detailed if you have that information, but most people aren't estimating this, right? We're, we're, we're just grabbing a number. So 0.4 is a comfortable um, uh, number to use. So once you have your design storage volume, I'm gonna skip over that example. Uh, Again, because we, we know that this, this information exists and there's plenty of directions on how to do this. Once you have that design storage volume, that's how you calculate what we call your physical storage capacity. The difference between design storage volume and physical storage capacity is the physical storage capacity relates the design storage volume to the drainage area. So you take your impervious cover, we multiply by, um, 3630, which is the cubic feet of water that comes off of an acre of uh, impervious in one inch of rain. And um, uh, so physical storage capacity is really design storage volume divided by that um, water that's coming off of your impervious cover. That will get you a um, calculation in inches. And I think Daniel will go into this maybe uh, in, into the example more in depth. Um, and that's how you kind of situate yourself on the curve. The last thing is infiltration capacity. So you, we use the Rawls um, infiltration rates and uh, this version 
of PTAP, I think, has um, six different infiltration factors. I believe the next iterations are going to have much more. We've modeled, we, we've modeled more. They're in the New England Retrofit Manual, and hopefully they'll appear in the new uh, MS4 permit as well, so uh, that we can actually model infiltration rates from 0 0.02 inches an hour all the way up to 8.27. The idea, again, if you don't know and you have relative estimates, would be to go, go down to the nearest. Um, so if you have like an infiltration rate of 0 0.75, uh, you probably model this or classify it as a 0 0.52 uh, infiltration inches per hour infiltration rate. Um, there are iterations of the, um, I, I'm forgetting whether, and maybe Danny will explain it, whether the bat interpolates, but um, you know some calculators will interpolate this. But um, if you can't fit on the curve, the, the best, um, advice is to go to the mo more conservative um, next um, level down. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, after you enter all that information, um, we can put it, we, we, we track it, and we route it through the bat, and we produce a report that has the load reduction, and Danny will go over that. I'm just realizing that I forgot one of the most important steps, and I didn't take you um, through the simple process, sorry, of um, registering for the database. Am I still sharing? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, sorry. Tom, I don't have the, the web link for the new um, blog spot, DES blog spot for PTAP. But one of the reasons why we did this is this is where it currently lives on the UNH site. UNH went through this whole revamp and it's very confusing. Uh, PTAP is buried under our projects page and now it's going to be up front and center. All the resources are going to be available on the DES blog. So we really appreciate and thank DES for that continued support and for making our lives a whole lot easier. So if you go to the database, you're gonna be um, greeted uh, by a basic screen like this. Um, and then if you click login, you're gonna have options. If you already have a login, you can log in using that username. If you want to create a new account, you simply just create a new account. It asks you for an email address. It asks you for a username. I don't know anybody that's uploaded the picture, but Go for it if you really want to get personal. Uh, and then we have these protections against the Russian hackers. Um, uh, we have an, a number of these capture protections because we do get a lot of spam. And then once you fill out all that information, you just push create an account. And that will um, email will go to any one of the administrators, Sally, myself, um, Daniel, um, and we will authorize that account. If you have a feeling that you want to register and you are going to be the town administrator, send us an email and let us know, and we'll make that correction as we authorize that account. And so I guess in, in some respects for now, we are the, the gatekeepers. And uh, additionally, if you have a um, consultant that maybe is doing a project in your community and they've registered for a PTAP account, and we haven't authorized it, um, send us an email. Because again, we sift through a large number of emails and anything that has like a Gmail or a strange attachment, we generally overlook just because we're looking at um, sometimes hundreds of applications and we're trying to read through the real versus non-real. And uh, I know some people have creative email names that look maybe, um, like they're not real and they are. So just send us an email if, they're, if we haven't responded in a reasonable time. Uh, the other thing is we will never ask, we will never provide you with your password. Uh, and this is one of the things that RCC has told me. And any, anything that sends you your password is really not very secure. 
If you lose your password or forget your password, all you have to do is reset your password. It'll ask you for your existing username and it'll send you an email with a new way to register and log in a new password. So I think that wraps up my portion and I'll hand it, oh, actually we'll, we'll stop for questions and maybe look in the chat and see if there's any questions on the basic information that I covered. And if not, we'll hand it over to Daniel to go over the example. Jamie, I have a question. So do does each community need that that higher user level does does there have to be i can't remember what the word was the administrator for each community um the, technically yes uh we have worked so uh, i'll give you an example though we've worked with uh, and i think newfields has a um administrator uh who's a part-time volunteer and so they had i think six four to six structural controls that they wanted to get into the data database. And we were able to just um, enter that for them. They gave us the information. Daniel entered that. He was able to accept everything. And, you know, I think, I don't think there's a, there's a big development rush in new fields. I'm not sure, but, you know, it, it's likely that they might do these batch updates every couple of years. Um, right. So that's a small community where we could kind of take that on, but, if you're a larger community, there's actually, and we'll get into this in the later um, sessions, but there's a lot of powerful ways that you can utilize this tool to review even individual um, individual per permitted uh, developments. So again, that's, that's for another day, but uh, every, it, it works best if every community has an administrator because you are essentially the overseer of what goes into the database. And then you can use the power of the database to review entries, assess them for their ability to meet your updated regulations, the 90% TSS, 60% uh, phosphorus, 50% nitrogen reduction. You can actually use the database to assess a entry's ability to meet that. Um, and then you can track that development through its permit. Cool. Okay. So if, if they're not sure who the administrator, the PTAP administrator would be, as long as they make an account, that's the yeah. first step. Yeah, make an account and reach out to us if you have stuff that you want to enter. We've also worked with uh, the city of Rochester with UNH and and others to batch import. We have a batch import feature where if you have say I have 60 BMPs that I have general information for, we have a form that we'll send you. Fill it out. It'll align all the essential information and we'll be able to batch import into the database. So it's a good way if you're just getting started and you have relative information about um, your structural controls, we can help you um, accelerate entry into the database. And typically what we do then is we accept them all as built and constructed and we have you go through and like if something's in the planning stage, maybe you just modify that one. So it's been pretty successful. Cool, that's awesome. All right, perfect. Just wanted to, to clarify that. Thank you, Jamie. And I'll put um, both your email and Sally's in the chat. So if people do want to reach out to you about being the PTAP administrator, the town administrator, they can do so. Yeah, and the information on the PTAP user levels and roles and responsibilities are included in the, in the blog. So hopefully, Tom or Andrew, you can drop that link so everybody has it because that's going to be your go-to spot. Yep. Not that and, I don't advocate you to go and get lost on the UNH website, but uh, I think the blog is, that's where we're going to, you know, from here on out, uh, continue to add resources and continue to build up as the go-to place. Perfect. And Andrea did drop that um, a couple minutes ago. It is in the chat for those that would like to pull it up. And if they want to register now or later on, you can do that. Oh, we're getting requests right now as we speak. People are signing up. Is Goofball so, 14 signing up? Goofball 14 did not sign up, but I did see someone who's in this meeting just send a request. So I will work on um, approving that while we're in the meeting. Um, and just to echo what Jamie said, like if you don't hear back from us, if you don't get your account approved, just please reach out to us because it's just humans. There's not bots approving these requests. And um, sometimes we just, we, we may not know you or your email looks a little shady or something like that. 
and we're not sure if you're spam or not. So if you don't hear from us like within a week, I would say email us and be like, hey, I'm legit, you know, give me an account. I want in. <laughs> so thank you. So I think we're throwing it over to Daniel um, to go over actually how to use the website. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm Daniel McAdam. I am a research engineer at UNH Stormwater Center, work with Jamie, and um, have been working on kind of the back end of this a bit into PTAP of um, working on the calculations, the entries, making sure it's a smooth process. Um, so I'm going to show just a simple example. Um, we're not going to go through all the design detail, and um, this is going to be a pretty high-level overview of, you know, this is our example. Let's put it into PTAP, and let's get credit. So within the next half hour or less, uh, we're going to go from a SEM on paper to pollution credits, to, to reduction credits. So let me share. Uh, so the example I'm going to go through is just going to be a high school, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. This is, like I said, it's going to be pretty quick. Um, the reason why we chose a high school is because it's, you know, it's typically the most impervious cover of any municipally owned land. Uh, so if a town has a high school, and most, most towns do, um, if you look at the, as Jamie said, we're only looking at the impervious cover for, for each parcel or each, each watershed. The impervious cover, the largest impervious cover on any property is typically the high school. Um, so it's a great place to start if you want to get some, some quick credits. Um, and a lot of high schools already have BMPs already installed um, or need to be retrofitted. Uh, so that's what we're, we're going to focus on here. And just to keep it simple, we're going to do two of the most common um, ap approaches here for treatment. We're going to do a subsurface infiltration practice. So this could be um, pipes, galleys, a trench of gravel, right? Anything that's subsurface just for infiltration. And one, bioretention. So bioretentions are uh, very common. And so we, we want to make sure to cover that. So just a quick little intro here to our site. Um, if you look, if you've seen any GIS or satellite images of any high school, uh, you should recognize pretty much everything here. It's a pretty common site. Uh, we have the big high school here. Um, I chose this site because it's it's all on one little square grid, so it's easy to go through and it's, as an example, uh, it's pretty clean. So we have one big rooftop. This is the main building of the high school. The main parking lot in the front, uh, some tennis courts, the track, a new sports field, uh, an auxiliary parking spot in the back, parking lot. And then we have, you know, the, the grass areas. We have a baseball field, a swale, um, just some open open grass. So pretty typical. Uh, nothing should be surprising here to anybody. If you look at all the impervious cover on the site, and we're not going to manage all this. I just want to show it from, uh, from a high level. So the rooftops, you know, we have a couple – auxiliary sheds and uh, concession stand, things like that. But the main roof is 4.56 acres. Uh, so you see the breakdown, all the roofs are in red. And then uh, pavement, everything that's pavement, parking lot or roads or sidewalks are in purple. And then athletic fields are in green. So athletic fields, um, you know, depending how they're built as well, the, the sports field could be that could be uh, up for a discussion, later discussion, whether or not it could be infiltrating depending on how it was built. Uh, but definitely the tennis courts and the track uh, would be impervious. So for this example, we have 18.99 acres of impervious. So remember, we're only looking at the impervious cover. Um, at the lower levels of the uh, treatment depths, as Jamie said, for the performance curves, we're only looking at impervious cover. So for this example, we're going to keep it really simple and, and keep it moving. We're just going to look at the two main um, sections of impervious cover to manage. We're going to do the rooftop and the main parking lot, and that's it. 
So first thing, we're going to look at the subsurface infiltration. Um, while I'm going through these, just a couple of things to note. One is whatever's in bold is the only information that's required for you to put into PTAP to have a submission. So there's a lot of, once we go over to PTAP, you'll see there's a lot of uh, fields that are optional if you if it's helpful for you to track them. But to actually get credit through the performance curves, you only need four to five pieces of information, uh, which I'm going to have here in bold. So first thing is subsurface infiltration. So that shows you the type of SCM, stormwater control measure. So we're going to manage the rooftop, and that's going to go to a subsurface infiltration um, galley here. I just put in the out in the field here for this example. Um, the impervious cover we've already measured, that's 4.56 acres. That's the rooftop. Um, we're, you know, this is a fictitious site, so I'm going to assume hydrolyzed soil group C. Uh, so that's about 0.27 inches per hour for this example. Obviously, if you could go out and do field testing, that would be better, but for this quick example should get us through. Design details, I have these up here on the PowerPoint just so that if you go back to it later, you have an example to walk through. I'm not gonna go through how to actually design it here. That's not what this workshop is about, um, but any designer should recognize this and be able to um, recreate it and follow along. But big picture, we have 100 by 100 foot footprint, uh, depth of three feet, so we're gonna excavate three feet, and then we're gonna have some pipes or galleys uh, within that back filled with stone. Uh, so that's going to give you back to that, uh, the table in Appendix F of how to calculate the DSV. Um, as Jamie said, we're just really calculating the void space for the porosity, the average porosity of the entire system. So it's a three foot trench with galleys and then back filled with stone. If we go through those calculations and we calculate the DSV, the design storage volume. That's how much water can we fill up into the system. That's 16,474 cubic feet. So that's the DSV. Uh, you'll notice this in bold. We need to know that piece. And then the PSC, or the physical storage capacity, and that's just the treatment of um, runoff depth, or the, the depth of treated runoff. In other words, from the rooftop, what depth of runoff can we put into this subsurface infiltration statically? Um, so that's just the DSV basically divided by the area, the um, impervious area, and then with the unit conversion of 3630, divide those two, and this one happens to be one inch. So let's say you have a one inch uh, retention standard for, for the rooftop here. So we have the DSV. 16,000 cubic feet, and a PSC of one inch. That is everything you need to put into PTAP. So that's one uh, BMP or SCM here. Uh, the next one is going to be a bioretention, exact same format here. Let's say we have a bioretention up in the front um, of the parking lot here. So we're draining, we're treating 4.01 acres of parking lot. Uh, that's going to go to a bioretention up at the front of the school. We'll assume the same 0.27 inches of infiltration rate. And again, design details, we can go through this later if you'd like a more detailed example of how to do the design and calculation. Uh, but for this example, we're just going to stick with the 7,900 cubic feet. So that's, again, fill up the bioretention with water, it can hold 7,900 cubic feet of water. Relating that back to the drainage area, divide 7,900 by the 4.01 with the unit conversion, and that treats 0.54 inches of runoff depth. And I'm just going to check the chat here. We have a couple chats. Looks like we're good. All right. So that's it. That's all we need for the PTEP. Um, we're going to go through, I'm going to jump over to, let's go. Hey, Daniel, I had a quick question. Yeah. I just don't remember. Um, 
it's for the uh, calculation credit. Is it calculated off the DSB or the PSC or either? You know, like what what is the most yeah. important? Good question. So in PTAP, all of these are required. So you have to have the system, the impervious and infiltration, right? Those never change. For PTAP, you do have to enter DSV and PSC currently. Um, from the actual performance curves, directly from the performance curves, all you have to know is the PSC, so the depth of treated runoff. Um, but again, if you know the impervious cover and either one of the DSV or PSC, you can calculate the other. So for PTAP, everything that's in bold is required. Um, if you're doing a manual calculation from the performance curve, you only need the PSC. Yeah, and but I guess again, that's, that's a great clarification. I guess I will add, uh, you know, one of the things that we've dealt with, especially if you don't have great information, we typically assume, right, if it's a conventional design, we assume a physical storage capacity of one inch in general. That's traditionally the water quality volume. So in New Hampshire, and probably Massachusetts, typically your system is already designed to statically store the one inch water quality volume. So if that's the case, you can assume that your physical storage capacity is one inch. And we've done that before. Like if you, you know, you're rub rummaging around in the box of um, receipts and you can't for the life of you find the cross section and do the calculation. I think we've, we've had success assuming that Again, if it's been built in the modern era in the last 10 years, uh, it typically will have a physical storage capacity of one inch. Yeah, thanks. And that's that's a great uh, clarification here. I'm approaching this from let's start at the design and move forward into the PTAP entry. Um, but as Jamie said, if you don't have that information, because this kind of works both ways, uh, you can go either from DSV to PSC or the other way around, or just skip the DSV if you don't know the cross-section. Um, so for this, I should have mentioned that the subsurface infiltration, uh, this is kind of an example of a traditionally sized full one inch uh, treatment depth, which is um, similar to the water quality volume. And the bioretention is sized for a much smaller 0.54 inches. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but there's a lot there's not much of a, a performance difference. So we're, we're cutting the size in about half, but the performance is not half. Performance is like 80 to 90%. Um, so it, it really depends if you go back to the performance curves and look, to, look at the distribution of rainfall. So this is the what we're eventually gonna get to with the credits is annual average performance. Um, and that means it's not just a single event uh, it's, it's not a linear correlation between the size and the performance because most rainfall events, most rainfall depths are much less than one inch. Well, the one inch is about the 90th percentile, um, but really most, the median percentile, uh, sorry, the median depth is about 0.4 inches of rainfall. So actually between 0.4 and 0.6 uh, can tend to be the, the most bang for your buck. Uh, after that, it's diminishing returns on if you build a bigger system, you get less and less treatment increase, performance increase. Um, so that's why I wanted to do this example. So we have kind of a conventionally sized one inch, which you know can be great for treating the rooftop runoff and getting that infiltration, uh, but you can you can get away with less too. Of course, always go back to your your standards. Um, and make sure you keep up with with your policies and standards in your in your town. All right, so I'm going to jump over to PTAP, and we're actually going to do a live entry here. So did it switch over to PTAP page? See Tom? Yes. Uh, so thanks for that. I got the link in the chat. So this is straight from the chat. You guys can follow along if you like or catch up to it later. So this is on the DES blog. Uh, right here, it jumps out at you as the PTAP database. Also a couple of resources that we've already brought up, instructions. If you want to know where did he get these DSV um, calculations, how do I 
you know, how do I convert between the two? Which one do I pick in PTAP to enter it? The instructions are right here. So you always have that as a resource. Um, there's more information for municipalities. The, the BMP crosswalk, uh, which Jamie showed before, if you're not sure which BMP to pick in the structural, uh, just because you're not sure of the name convention, you have a crosswalk here. So the goal is to have everything right at your fingertips. So we're going to go to the PTAP database. I've already logged in. Um, as Jamie showed before, you go to login and then, um, yeah, login. Obviously, I already have an account. So to enter these, I'm going to go to add submission. Add submission is for a new project. Um, I do want to note it's for a new project because this is one project with two um, SCMs, it's just one entry. Um, so think of this as the bigger, bigger project. You can add, you can add rows to add as many structural or non-structural BMPs as you like. So you don't have to do a single entry for every, um, every BMP. So one thing to note, um, as Jamie said, we're really trying to pare this down to the minimum required um, information to get credit. So if you don't know very much, or if you're going back um, and entering older projects, we, we want to encourage getting more entries um, and not requiring you know, the map number, and block number, and lot number. That's really for your, your information uh, as a municipality. So only the starred entries, the starred fields, are truly required to have a successful entry. So project name, it can be this, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, I already have a high school example. If it's, you know, if it's related to your, another database that you have or some sort of unique identifier that you have, uh, that's what you can put here. A couple of check boxes, again, are not required, but uh, will we'll help sort the submissions later. So if it's for a municipality or not, if it's in an MS4 area, um, if it's within 200 meters, of a coastal zone or stream buffer if it discharges to an impaired water body. So for this example, I'll just check those. And I've seen a couple of chats pop up. I want to make sure we're not missing anything. Okay. So all of these, I'm going to skip for this example. Um, obviously, a lot of these should be pretty self-explanatory. Who owns the property? where the maps are. Um, if you want to keep track of your HUC 10 uh, watershed for now, we just have it for the, really for the seacoast. You do have to select your town. Um, and this, if you're, I believe if you're an authenticated user, you can enter for any town, but you're not allowed to see other entries for that town. Um, but you can modify your own entries later on. For this example, I don't believe we have anybody in Lee, and I picked Lee uh, because it's a nice little name. Land use type, uh, commercial seems appropriate for this, and that's just the basic project information. So that will apply to every all the submission and any structural or not structural BMPs. So it's just for the project. And then we have a couple other sections here. One section is Structural BMPs. I'll come back back to that in a minute. The next section is non-structural BMPs. Uh, so for this, we have operation and maintenance, catch basin cleaning and fertilizer, IDDE, leaf collection, regulations, new ones, new septics, um, pet waste pickup, measured and modeled street sweeping. So for some of these, there aren't actually crediting schemes yet. Um, but we have them in here kind of as placeholders so that you can start putting in, you can start filling out the database. And once we have enough traction, we can always go back and, and uh, if we have the information, we can apply credits to them. So, for example, if I selected municipal regulations, there's no credit for it. No, there's no units, but you can just say, I've, you know, I put in three regulations and put it in the description. You know, if it's something useful, we can always go back and update the database uh, with 
with how to calculate credits. For others like catch basin cleaning, uh, you'll notice when you select it, there does pop up a new option, a new field for the units. Uh, so either the number of catch basins cleaned or the impervious surface managed. And one thing to note with this, if you're doing catch basin cleanings, you don't have to enter a new entry every single time you clean the catch basin. This is annual credits, and this one is just a multiplier. So let's say you clean 2,000 catch basins in a year. This is your yearly entry. So you really just need one entry for the whole year. Um, same can go for street sweeping. If you keep track of it and then, oh, yep, Jane is. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So that was just a quick little teaser on the structural, non-structural TFTs. Uh, we also have a land use conversion and wastewater management table. I'm going to skip those for now. I just want to give you a little sneak peek of what's in here. Uh, so I'm going to focus on just the bioretention and subsurface infiltration. So as Jamie mentioned, the infl I'm going to choose the surface infiltration for the bioretention. For this one, I'm going to assume it has uh, actually is infiltrating. So biofiltration might be appropriate if there's an under drain and there is no infiltration. Impervious surface managed. These are my bold numbers that I had up. Uh, runoff volume at the storage capacity. You'll notice the units too, so that'll pull you back. That's the DSV. That was 7,900. Design storm depth is 0.54. And that's it. That's my entry for the bioretention. Add a row and put in my subsurface infiltration. Uh, that's going to be also infiltration. And let me make sure I get the right numbers. So 4.56 acres. This was a bigger 16,474 cubic feet. Design storm depth was one inch. And infiltration rate's the same. Right away, you'll see your total managed acres. So that's just adding up the impervious cover. Go down and check the box that I certify that this is true and correct, and save it. Uh, one thing to make sure when you press save, make sure you get this green button at the top that is successfully saved. Um, sometimes, let's say you forgot to check the town or you have missing information, like I left off the impervious cover. If I press save and I get an error, you know, impervious surface manage must be greater than zero. Make sure you check that so you know the submission is actually complete. All right, so from here, I'm not going to go through all the steps, but if I go to my submissions. Uh, the first one is going to be the high school example. I'll just filter this real quick. One thing I wanted to note real quick with this approval status. This is new submission because it's brand new. I just entered it. This is where a town administrator, a town administrator PTAP, would have to come in and actually change the approval status. Right now, only the approval status of approved and constructed will actually get credit. So this is a way to track you know, projects in different phases. Obviously, only if it's approved by the town and it's constructed and actually in the field performing uh, does it get credits. So in there, I would edit this submission. And because I am an administrator, um, I can actually change the approval status. And go back to that submission. And now I'll see it's approved and um, constructed. So from here, there's this little arrow. Uh, you'll notice two export buttons. One is for structural, one is for non-structural. They have a different format. Uh, because this project only has structural, I'm going to export the structural BAT export. So BAT's the EMP crediting tool. So that exports a CSV. And then I'm not going to show 
uh, the actual process through BAP, but it's, it's pretty straightforward from this CSV. And let's skip back to my PowerPoint here. Daniel, I wanted to let you know too, there's a, a good question in the, in the chat as well. Yes, please. Um, I'll let you answer it and read it because it's long and I think you're going to be able to interpret it better than I can. Um, yeah, Jamie already answered the short answer is no. So the performance curves are only looking at impervious cover. That's the short answer. So I'm going to keep moving with this a little bit, and we can come back uh, if there's additional discussion with that. So share. So I just have a slide here. These are the four screens going from that PTAP export to the BAT tool. Um, import that CSV in the BAT. It calculates your credits. And uh, this is kind of like the, the movie magic. I put the cake into the oven and then take out the, the fully baked, beautiful cake. Um, it's, it's really just a couple of minutes. So I just want to skip that for time. But this is what you get. You get a, a Word document um, report. This is a final report from BAT that is from their approved tool, ready for submission um, to EPA. So. This will show you your city. Um, it shows you your, you know, anything that you, any extra information that you put in here would be at the top. Um, but uh, what I really want to show, this is your total credits. So just for those two uh, BMP entries that we put from one entry from one submission, we got 10.5 pounds per year of phosphorus reduction, 83 pounds of nitrogen, and 3,000 pounds of sediment. So, you know, that quickly we got, we got all those numbers uh, ready to submit in a report. The next page, it actually has a breakdown of every single BMP and it gives you um, right, the credits for, for each one. So you can see the, the storage capacity, the phosphorus reduction, the efficiency, so more detail about every single one, um, as well as the treated area, the runoff depth. So this way you can go back and really um, kind of look at performance of each one and uh, also use it for review for, you know, making sure everything is um, up to date and accurate. But really this first table um, is where, where we're going to focus. So that's, that's your final credit. So just a summary of the, this quick example in just a few minutes. We identified treatment for 45% of the impervious cover from this one parcel. And just from those two areas, we submitted two structural BMPs in the PTAB. And just with those two credits, we, we created a report from BAT ready for submittal to the EPA um, with 11 pounds of phosphorus reduction per year, 83 pounds of nitrogen, and 3,000 pounds of TSS per year. So it's really, it should be that easy. Of course, there's always exceptions. There's always nuances for more complicated projects. Uh, but hopefully, we want to show you these are pretty common scenarios. Um, it should be pretty, it can be this quick and easy to, to go from start to finish. So that's all I have for the actual entry. Uh, so I might turn it back to Tom or see if we have any other questions or comments. Daniel, we do have one question in the comment, uh, in the, mm -hmm. the chat, and it says, is the phosphorus reduction credit cumulative in subsequent reporting years? Would new BNPs be added to the previous reduction totals? So this is pounds per year every year, assuming it's maintained and in, in proper performance. So this the short, the short answer is yes. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then so you, you wouldn't duplicate up... this entry every year. Right. So this if this stays approved and constructed next year, 
it's still there proving constructed. Yeah. And again, Daniel mentioned assuming operation and maintenance. Currently, you get credit in perpetuity. There is no sunset of the um, credit due to operation and maintenance. My guess is maybe this is something we're going to see evolve over subsequent permits where I, I doubt we're going to get credit in perpetuity without some type of assurance that uh, operation and maintenance is happening. So it's, that's something still to come and we are working on the functionality in the database to do that. Uh, and we'll be ready when the rules change. Um, the exception would be for non-structural controls, right? Those are not cumulative. You would need to enter your non-structural controls every year. So every year, you know, you're getting, depending on the linear lane or lane miles of street sweeping or number of catch basins cleaned, um, you know, that's not a cumulative credit. That's a yearly credit, but we'll go over that next time. Daniel, I have a related question. Um, you talked about the bat, and if I remember correctly, and I just want to clarify, um, you all at UNH run that behind the scenes, right? And then the report gets sent out. So um, people using PTAB don't have to worry about that. Correct. And you, we have it on our site. So if you'd ever like to use it, you can, uh, but we will, yeah, we can run this for the towns um, every year for submitting to the permit. Okay, awesome. Permit. Awesome. I, I knew I thought that was part of the behind the scenes magic, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. And one of the okay. things I neglected to add is um, so, you know, we're really indebted to DES for the startup funding to actually get PTAP off the ground. And as Ted said, it was a significant investment of time and staff and money. Uh, since uh, for the last two years, however, the Municipal Alliance for Adaptive Management, uh, that's the alliance between Dover, Portsmouth, Rochester, um, and Exeter and, and others um, have been funding the, uh, the, I guess, the maintenance of the database, you know, so we're pay they're paying for the hosting, they're paying for routine updates, they're paying for technical assistance necessary to get, I mentioned we got Newfield's uh, information in, we're working on Rollinsford and, and um, Newington, so they've been really uh, funding uh, the the care and feeding of PTAP uh, for the last two to three years. Um, yeah. And we also mentioned one of the exciting things, unless there's questions, we've got a, a number of time for questions, so maybe we can just open it up. But I will add that one of the most exciting things and one of the reasons why we didn't take PTAP into a two of a technical um, world, you know, we we kept it sort of horse and buggy, that um, and and pretty pretty uh, functional, but not very complicated. One of the reasons why we did that is because if you have your ear on the ground, these credits, not so much for the structural controls, but some of the non-structural controls, and maybe even for some of the structural controls that haven't been invented yet, are very innovative. They're innovating as we speak, and they're changing. And that's one of the most exciting things as we implement, we're learning new ways, we're finding uh, cheaper, better, more effective strategies. And PTAP has the ability to um, incorporate that because it is so, um, you know, bare bones. And, and um, so we're, we're really looking forward to, you know, like including uh, the updated sweeping credits. Um, there's potential to get much more, um, uh, load reduction associated with uh, efficient uh, sweeping. Um, so we're really excited about that and we're ready to make those changes. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll see. We're, we're hoping, um, you know, to continue to update as the science changes. Anyone have any questions related to what Daniel went through or PTAP in general? We know we've thrown a lot of information at you, but the recording will be online too if you want to review it and watch it again, or if you need to poke around in PTAP first. Okay, um, Sally did let me know that there are a number of you who are registering for PTAP, so this is fantastic. So keep keep that going. We absolutely love to see that. Um, 
Let me just share my screen really quickly. I just wanted to show everyone where on the website it was. I know Daniel went over the website, which I appreciate immensely. Um, and in case you are not familiar with our MS4 website, if you just go to nhms4.des.nh.gov or just Google New Hampshire MS4, it'll come right up. Um, just make sure it's the, the newhampshire.gov website. Under NH resources, there's the pollutant tracking and accounting project. And as Daniel said, there's the background information up here, the link to the database itself, and then there's some additional resources in the recording of today's um, workshop. We'll go down here along with the PowerPoint that we used in case you want to review that. I also wanted to mention, oh, hang on, guys, I should have launched the the PowerPoint. I also wanted to mention that we do have two more workshops coming up. So we have the non-structural controls workshop on July 17th. As Daniel alluded to, we'll be going into things like street sweeping and catch basin cleaning. And then on October 10th, we have the more advanced features for those that are looking to use PTAP to the, to the max, basically, because there's a lot you can do there, as Jamie and Daniel have mentioned. Um, again, any any questions or anything like that? Okay. Again, we know it's going to take a little bit to get used to this. And I wanted to show our contact information in case you don't know. Um, for PTAP related registration questions, obviously contact Jamie Hool or Sally Sewell. Um, and then for PTAP in general, um, Jamie, Sally, and I have been talking. I'm going to be the go-between just so that way I can, I can filter these questions. Feel free to email me as well. Um, we'll definitely make sure we can get you those answers uh, and we're here to assist so you're not alone in this it isn't like we're going to do this presentation and just leave you out in the cold we can help you get registered we can help you enter the information we know it's a new tool and we know that there's a lot to it so we're definitely here to assist you all to get this information in and as Daniel was showing it's not that hard to do. You just got to gather the information beforehand and then you can get that report for your um, annual reports for those that are MS4 communities. So this is really helpful, mostly moving forward, mostly for those, again, with the um, phosphorus TMDLs or nitrogen or phosphorus impairments. All right. So if no one has any additional questions, it looks like we might wrap up a little early unless anyone on the presenting side has anything else to add. No, oh, other than to say, you know, we are here to help like Jamie and Daniel and their team have a really good track record of helping municipalities get information into PTAP. So, and, you know, getting reports out to town. So we are here to help. Um, and it's exciting to have new PTAPers on board. Um, after all these years, we've grown. Yay. Yay. Yeah. I it's hard for me to leave the the extra air time. So I'll, I'll just add um, one of our focuses too, and you know, this is a decision we made long ago and I'm really happy about it, is we really wanted to shift the, um, I, I guess the, the ownership of the implementation efforts onto the communities. And we wanted to offload the concerns about baseline or um, future loading right, from the community. So essentially, when we draw this line, we're like communities, you have enough to deal with, just focus on implementation, getting your implementation efforts into the database and getting the correct accounting for it. That's your the next five to 10 years of your focus. There are ongoing efforts more at a regional level about what the future land use change is gonna look like and the attendant load that might be associated with future land use changes. And that, so I think the most appropriate location for that discussion is at a regional level. Uh, you know, it's not really at the local level. Land use changes are really difficult to track at a local level, you know, because you have these um, issues with what, what de minimis is, like what, you know, most, it, according to the EPA regulations, you don't regulate anything, any disturbance less than an acre. Most communities are going beyond that, but Again, we want to emphasize that we're trying to offload the burden of baseline and projected land use changes off communities and get that done at a regional GIS. 
area a level where that can be more efficiently and more accurately done. And then move the burden of just implementation, getting credit for the good work that you're doing onto communities. So that's really the focus, I think. And, and for me, that kind of clarifies things, right? Um, I think it's easy to model land use change. It's hard to be right. You know, that's a space where everybody's wrong. Some people are closer than others, depending on how you do it, but everybody's still wrong. So. Thanks, Jamie. And I think too, and I don't know if we talked about this at the beginning, um, if you choose to use PTAP, that goes, it's very New Hampshire. That's how we've been approaching the MS4 permit. We've all been approaching things the same way. You might change it a little bit, but if we're all doing this, on the same level, if there ever were questions, even though EPA has approved of PTAP, if there ever were questions, UNH, DES, we're here to help. We can defend it. We can say why we did this. Um, and if a majority of people are using it, um, it's just easier for EPA to get on board with it and to, to understand it. And Gretchen, I saw that your, your hand went up, so I want to throw it over to you because it... All right. Yeah. Well, just because we've got a second, I would just say this PTAP, it comes up all the time as a solution to some of the reservations that um, like EPA might have about what communities are actually doing and trying to move the needle without getting too bogged down and creating plans and having plans all speak the same language and stuff like that. We've really been able to say, listen, don't worry so much about um creating these sort of elaborate plans, the proof is in the PTAP, right? It's it's right there. So the more that we can put in there and show EPA that that's what we're really doing, we're really working on these nutrient reductions and TSS reductions, um, the, the more it helps them um, have confidence in all the good work that we are doing. So it, it comes up constantly. And um, the more of us that are using it, the more data that's in there, um, the more confidence they're going to have. So that's great. I think we got a new uh, moniker for TED. The proof is in the PTAP. <laughs> T shirts coming soon. <laughs> Thanks, Gretchen. All right. Well, thank you everyone again for attending and thank you um, for all the presenters to UNH, DES, everyone that's been involved with this. Um, we appreciate this. Again, there's more workshops coming, so keep an eye out for that. I sent everybody invites. We'll also be sending out an email um, where this recording will be located, the PTAP website link, and then also the information on registering, so that way you know who to send questions to if you have any. Um, but that way, you, hopefully it's a little less overwhelming. We'll get it all in an email and have all that, that information for you. All right. But on that note, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and if you're taking time off next week for the 4th of July, have a great vacation. <laughs>